Elkins, West Virginia, and we feel blessed to be up on this beautiful hill with a beautiful sunrise to greet us on this day. There are about 700 undergraduate students at this school, and historically we are affiliated with the Presbyterian Church USA. When I first became involved in the life of the college, it was about 2011, where President Bucksmith asked our spiritual life committee, we're related to the Presbyterian Church, but what does that mean for us in the 21st century? Because that probably looks a little different than it did when the college was founded in 1904. And since then, we have been wrestling with what does it mean to articulate our historic values as a church-affiliated school while being authentic in educating students for the world in which they live. Over the summer, I was able to read a book called No Longer Invisible. And when we received the grant dollars for this event, I said, hey, I think that we should contact the Jacobsons to see if they would be willing to share the insights from this book at this event um, in March. I'm going to Just as American religion is changing, higher education is changing, and together there has been a remarkable change in the place of religion on campuses. You know that on lots of campuses, uh, students are not interested in people telling them who they should be. That's, that's religion as opposed to spirituality. Uh, but they are interested in having opportunities to think and to reflect together on issues that are important for them in terms of their personal understanding of who they are, who they're called to be, and what they hope for in this world. And if we can make those kinds of spaces in the curriculum for that to happen, uh, it can be an enormously rewarding and enriching thing. Is that it's nice to have conservative or evangelical Christian students on campus and to have Muslim students on campus because they know what they believe and they're willing to argue about it. And it raises the level of conversation for everybody because other people that go, well, I'm, I'm Presbyterian, but I, you know, I'm, uh, you know, all of a sudden those Presbyterian kids or Lutheran kids or whoever either have to go back and say, what the heck do we believe? You know, what, what, you know, or, or they have to discover it, become more articulate themselves. So educationally, it can be a great opportunity. We've also found a lot of frustration with evangelical groups, though, because especially if people are doing interfaith ministry, evangelicals are often, there's a lot of pushback and will not become involved in those, uh, even though it would be really healthy for them to do that. It's one, one of the reasons why Ibu Patel's last book was largely directed at an evangelical audience, saying you should be part of this conversation, too. Um, but you're absolutely right. Right now, mainline churches and more liberally oriented religious groups are not doing as good a job preparing their students to be articulate in the public world of the university as people from more conservative or evangelical groups are forming their students to be articulate in that public world of the university. And that's, so that sort of throws it back. The churches, how are we forming students before they get to college? I hope that one outcome of this um, return of religion to all campuses, state, everywhere, will be that church-related institutions reinvigorate their own mission to be, to say, we are training we are providing education in a very particular way. And for uh, churches to support college-based ministry at church-related institutions because they can do things differently than can happen on a state campus. But I think in this day and age in social media, one of the difficulties with civic engagement um, is too much information. Um, what are you going to pick when it's scrolling through your newsfeed every day? There's the too much information, and then there's the sense that if I just share this Facebook post, and that'd be a great way, another great program to have. If I just share this Facebook post about a political candidate, about a cause, 
I'm doing something. Um, and we can, there's certainly been studies to show people have been engaged and movements have arisen through t Twitter and other places. But there, that's another problem. One, I think it creates a sense of we've done something. But two, I think it also creates a sense of helplessness. Um, again, so one of the things that I would like to see that we have not implemented is a sustained focus on a particular issue. Um, we, we tend to serve and do this, and I would recommend and would hope to implement at some point that this year our focus is going to be hunger. Um, and what we're going to do is study hunger in our tradition and what our tradition says about that. We're going to study what's going on with hunger in Morgantown, West Virginia, and then we're going to go out and serve, and then we're going to start the conversation over. Um, I think one of the things that we found is most difficult is just teaching college students how to have real human in-person conversations when the default is so often to be texting and tweeting and Facebooking and all of those things. So I think, um, may, you know, in order to engage this in a real way, I think requires in-person conversation, requires face-to-face. -face. It's hard to talk about faith, especially across lines of difference when you're not talking to a real human and when you're looking at your phone and other things. So I think creating spaces to be a little countercultural in that sense is really important for higher education to do this well, but I think there are also ways to capitalize upon that technology to um, globalize what would otherwise be a, a more siloed world. To become, in a sense, part of the context. You have to become bilingual, if you will. And so there's a real problem when campus ministries set themselves up as youth group on steroids. You know, If campus ministry is nothing more than another pizza party, if it's nothing more than another bowling party, and quite frankly, I'm going to I'm going to upset a lot of people here. If it's just another service project, okay, what's the point? What's that about? So for those of us who are religious workers on campuses, we need to be engaged in perpetual scholarly endeavors ourselves. We need to be constantly teaching ourselves, learning ourselves in dialogue and in dialogue with the academy. And um, I mean, I just left this job, so I, the, the exit interview they had with my superiors had with me, and they said, what do you think is one of the keys here? Because they said, you seem to have a good relationship broadly with the faculty and the administration and with the students. And I said, you don't have to be the most interesting man in the world. I might look like him, but I'm not him. You do not have to be the most interesting man in the world. You have to be the most interested man in the world. And if we're going to be in the midst of the academy as religious people, we have to have the same excitement about learning that every academic has. And that will allow us more easily to talk to any student or academic. Remember, this, these are not just student ghettos. We're also chaplains to the academics. We're chaplains to the staff. And how are they ever going to take us seriously and want to be in any partnership with us if we don't care about them as human beings? If we don't take seriously their questions, and we don't honor their research. A tip to any campus pastor, you want to start developing positive relationships with your faculty. When you run into a street, ask them what research they're engaged in. And be honestly interested in it. Because believe me, most of their colleagues aren't. And if you show that you are interested in what they are studying and what they're researching in their work, if you honor their vocation as a Christian, who is teaching in the academy, or is a non-Christian teaching academy, believe me, the door's open. And we think one thing that's important uh, for colleges is to have this perspective of interfaith when their classes and events kind of getting students to come together and actually be talking and asking these kind of questions about other faiths, not just Christianity, but also about this, what the students have to say about Muslim or about Jewish, because we have those students on campus and it's important to be able to bring those students together and ask those important questions on campus and to feel open about that sort of thing. And to move to the next point would be the opportunities for engagement, which would give students the open opportunity on campus to bring up those sort of questions. Uh, we could have events where we sh uh, uh, celebrate the holidays of other, uh, uh, other faiths, or we can hold events where 
multiple faiths can come together to celebrate something together. Another important thing we uh, noted was relevance and the fact that we need to be able to stay with the topics that are being talked about today in, in other places that we need to address. If something happens, how do we address it and how is that relevant to what we're doing on campus every day? The last thing we thought was super important was faculty and having a strong faculty who encompasses all three of these things, who are, are staying relevant, are trying to find opportunities, and have an interfaith perspective that is willing to encourage all the students on campus. So what we're doing is we're not just focusing on ourselves, we're not just focusing on the campus, but we're focusing on a global aspect and spreading the love of God. It doesn't just have to be here in America, but it can go all over which I think is very important because if we want to, if we want to fortify the body of, of Christ, then we want to be able to reach out to everyone. And I think the best way to do that is by showing love to everyone, especially those who are in need. You have to have an open heart to love everybody as Jesus Christ calls us to do. You know, there's no parameters on his love. And whether that be a Jew, uh, Muslim, whatever it be, you bring them in and you love them just the same as you love everybody that's gathered in this room. With those open doors, find ways to have ecumenical services where you invite everybody. No parameters, just like Jesus Christ calls us to do. Have the doors of the chapel open. Have the doors of the college open to whoever wants to come in and be rejuvenated, observe their Sabbath in any way that they feel necessary. That, those are ways that we, as college and universities, can be working to strengthen the relationship of religion and spirituality in our academic environments. We carry the love in different uh group Bible studies and stuff, and we want to try to start like a, like a roundtable discussion where you just come in and discuss the differences of viewpoints and things like to kind of accept each other's differences and understand them because we got a lot of people who are very closed-minded and they're like, this is how I was raised, this is my viewpoint, this is the only right way, and I don't want to hear what you have to say. Like, it, we get a lot of that and we also get a lot of even when we do work together as groups, Sometimes we forget to put ourselves out of the picture and focus on the glory of God. We, we get caught up in the, I want the acknowledgement for what I did rather than what he did. And so it's just a struggle of trying to take people who are, you know, I mean, you're in college hopefully for four years. Right. For I think there's an opportunity there um, through just fellowship and food, the two Fs, and uh, just bringing people together and uh, celebrating the differences and pre just breaking bread. So I think there's an opportunity there as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be intentional about trying to get people uh, to help with uh, the prison ministry and uh, with, um, I do a Bible study at the Elkins Mountain School on Tuesday nights for about 90 minutes. And... Um, Starting in the fall, I'm going to get my church to, we're going to do start our van ministry and picking up, see if kids want to come to church and we'll pick them up and take them. So we're looking forward to that. The two biggest things that we've taken away from this is it's inspired us and it's reassured us. Uh, as far as like inspiration goes, it, it's inspired us to refocus on diversity and outreach again and to just kind of think about what we believe, you know, who we are and why we do what we do as Christians, like what, what are our beliefs and where do they stem from? It was also uh, very reassuring to come here and hear other students talk about some of the struggles that they face in outreach and things like that, and that we were given solid answers on how we could, you know, solve some of those problems and things we could do to help with that. Uh, what we want to do to take away from this is I'm gonna put it this way we're gonna walk the talk <laughs> and what I mean by that is uh, we spend a lot of time talking about ideas and planning things when we do implement them but we spend a lot of time talking about them and kind of trying to pick which ones are best and perfecting them and this time we're gonna go back and we're gonna 
we're going to take those old ideas and the new ones from here that we've been inspired by, and we're going to really put them into action, and we're going to walk that talk.